Today on the Mr. Maple Show, we talk about how to grow Japanese maple. We're going to discuss everything from choosing a Japanese maple, planting, watering, fertilizing, pruning, and things to avoid when growing Japanese maples. So we hope this helps y'all grow Japanese maples. Hey guys, thanks so much for joining us again. Uh, I think we've got a good one today. We, we had to get this one out of the way before we got too far into the podcast because it's such an important topic. We're going to talk about how to grow Japanese maples. I'm real excited for this one. I think this is one that's going to help a lot of people out, especially a lot of people who are just beginning growing Japanese maples. We've got a lot of really cool future podcast interviews set up already too. So we're real excited about what's coming on. Make sure you follow us on whatever podcast platform you really like. We've got Shop of, uh, we've got Spotify, we've got Pen, uh, Pandora, we've got Amazon Music. I mean, you name it on when it comes to podcasts, we're out there. So make sure you subscribe to us there and make sure you subscribe to us on YouTube because we add YouTube videos every single day. We really appreciate it. Make sure you like our video, subscribe, and also sign up for our weekly emails on Mr. Maple. We had 10 new cool trees every Tuesday at 10 a.m., and if you're just beginning in Japanese maples, you got to go to mrmaple.com and start shopping. We've got one of the largest selections of Japanese maples in the United States. We're a mail order company. We ship directly to your door. Yeah, now we're going to be talking about how to grow Japanese maples. And that Mr. Maple show there on YouTube, we're already going to have a lot of instructional videos on there too. So this is really great for you guys who are just finding us through the podcast. But definitely check out some of those how-to videos we go through and some you know real good explanations. And a lot of these will already have videos with them on the YouTube channel. So first off, we're going to talk about choosing a Japanese maple. Now we do over a thousand varieties here at our nursery, but we've been saying that for quite a while. I think we've been seeing over a thousand varieties for like 10 years now. We're probably closer to 1500. I know next spring, Brian and Wesley are actually going to get us an accurate number on what we actually have here, but we've got an amazing assortment of Japanese maples that we're growing. And because of that, there's all different shapes and sizes. So Our first podcast we did was what is a Japanese maple? And we talked about how they're Japanese maples from three feet to 30 feet in a 10 year frame. So there's a lot of different changes there. So choosing the right Japanese maple for your location is really that first step. It's like choosing the right dog. Think of Japanese maple cultivars as almost like breeds of dog. And you wouldn't want a Great Dane if you're looking for a Chihuahua. So you want to to line it up there with what you're looking for. And that's going to help a lot long term. It's going to avoid a lot of the other issues you can avoid down the road by picking the right type to begin with. Yeah, you can definitely avoid a lot of maintenance. I mean, Japanese maples are maintenance-free. That's one of the reasons we love Japanese maples. But if you choose a very fast-growing Japanese maple for a small spot, you're going to constantly be trying to prune that tree back to try to keep it in your small spot. Where if you selected a smaller Japanese maple for that same spot, it would do fantastic and you would have less maintenance and less care that you actually have to do to take care of that Japanese maple in that spot. We talked a little bit last week about people choosing the wrong tree for the wrong, wrong spot with Steve Bender, the grumpy gardener. And we call it the maple massacre where they poodle the Japanese maples because they've chosen a large growing tree for a small spot. You know, with Japanese maples, there's a thousand varieties. And that means that we have varieties that are narrow, varieties that are dwarf. And so we've got a Japanese maple to fit everyone's spot in their garden. And so if you start out by choosing the right Japanese maple, the Japanese maple is going to do much easier it's going to be so much easier for you to grow. And that's really the first key step. We've got Japanese maples that are heat tolerant, Japanese maples that are sun tolerant, Mm -hmm. Japanese maples. Most Japanese maples can do well with some morning sun and afternoon shade. Mm -hmm. But if you're going for a sunny location, you need to make sure you select a Japanese maple that can handle that. So we've got some great videos on YouTube about heat tolerant Japanese maples. Uh, We got, I think a three part series. It's going to be growing. And you can go watch those videos to learn about which ones are heat tolerant, which ones are more sun tolerant to help you choose the right Japanese maple if you have a sun in your location. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we get questions a lot of times like, hey, should I pick a Japanese maple for a wet spot in my yard? Not typically the way to go for a Japanese maple. So there's not going to be selections that want boggy or wet feet. But there are going to be a lot of selections for most other things you can do. There's great Japanese maples for containers for bonsai, for, you know, heavy shade, heavy sun locations. Now, we list Japanese maples as working zones 5 
through zones nine. Now that's actually a perfect analogy on the East Coast. So East Coast, those zone breakdowns work magnificently. Like once you get right into zone 10, Florida, that's right really at the cusp for the heat index for Japanese maples. Now, if you know anything about the USDA hardiness zones, they're really set up by how cold an area gets. So it has nothing really to do with how hot it gets. So California, Arizona, some of those other areas, they can throw off the zone chart just a little bit. Uh, you know, I often bring up our friend Aaron Dragseth, good customer of ours. He's in zone 10, California, but his heat index is so low, he doesn't really, you know, get too high into the 90s. He doesn't really get below about 40. So he's kind of in that zone 10 because he doesn't get very, very cold, yet his heat index is very, very low. That That is that is a, a outlier of an example because California certainly has some areas that break that. But especially for you East Coast listeners, zones 5 through 9 is an excellent starting place for where you can grow Japanese maples. Oftentimes, you know, zone four uh, can be a little too cold for most Japanese maples. There are some specific cultivars you can get into with Acer Seaboldianum and Acer Pseudo Seaboldianum that can handle a little bit more cold tolerance than your typical Japanese maple. But when we're talking about what people think of those lace leaves and those red uprights and things in section palmata, those are going to do best zones five through nine. So choosing your Japanese maple is definitely your first step with growing Japanese maples. If you choose the wrong Japanese maple for the wrong spot, if you chose a Crimson Queen, for instance, that is a fantastic, beautiful, weeping red lace leaf, mm -hmm. but you put it in full sun in the deeper south, it's going to burn. But by choosing a Tamukiyama that looks very similar, has a very similar growth habit, it's a tree that will thrive and do well. So make sure you do your research first and choose the Japanese maple that's best for your spot. And you can do a lot of that research on MrMaple.com. We've got photos, we've got descriptions, and we've often got videos associated with each cultivar. So you can go in and watch a cultivar highlight on that specific cultivar that you're looking at trying to purchase and trying to choose. So make sure you choose the right tree for the right spot. And that's always the very first step with growing Japanese maples. Yeah, and we're always glad to help with that here. You can always call our office or email us with suggestions. Now, uh, keep in mind when you're picking that out, that if you're wanting to create a low weeping Japanese maple, the number one mistake people make is picking, uh, you know, maybe they grew something from seed. Maybe they grew a seedling somebody gave them because that's a cheap way to get started. Great plants too. That's how my grandmother got into Japanese maples was through seedlings. But they, they're trying to turn maybe a larger upright seedling into a low weeping or dwarf variety. And they're going to be fighting a losing battle there. I mean, you can't, you really can't weigh them down too much. You really can't create a weeping shape unless it's something that naturally has those traits ingrained in its DNA. So by starting out with a cultivar, it's going to be a smaller compact form. Naturally, it's going to be the natural traits that you can, you can really, you know, get ahead of the curve. So there's, there's Japanese maples that have every single shape and size, and uh, there's no reason to fight an uphill battle. You can't turn an emperor one, you know, into a weeping form. You're just going to be losing out there. It wants to be a nice upright red tree. And, uh, you know, by picking the right cultivar, you're going to be way ahead of the game. We, we see that all the time. Someone chooses an Emperor One or a red blood good seedling that they picked up at a local uh, farmer's market, and then they're back there trying to shear it back or trying to train it into a weeping habit. I know exactly what you're talking about, and that's something that by choosing a weeping variety for that spot or a low-growing variety, you've already won that battle. Um, the next thing we're going to get into is planting a Japanese maple. This is, you've got your Japanese maple, you've chosen the right one for the right spot. So how do I plant it, Matt? Well, I'd actually jump into one more thing right before planning. You know, a lot of our customers are mail orders, so they're getting those in. Exactly right. And, uh, you know, th these steps are all going to work great for everybody if you're picking it up at a local garden center and things like that. But I like to stress to people there's a few things to do if you're getting it from a mail order after making that selection before planning. Uh, you know, it's really simple. I mean, we, we this stuff's going to be common sense, but take it out of the, the bags, take it out of the box, you know, make sure it's getting watered thoroughly. Then get your plant into some shade. You don't want to put it in full heavy sun if it's been in shipment. Um, but then after that, your tree's, you know, watered in well. And give your tree a second to acclimate, especially in a shadier spot before you put it into a direct full sunlight if it's been in a box in shipment. But after that, you're, you're ready to get into planting. So, I um, mean, it's pretty simple to go through those steps pretty quick. Um, and, and that seems like something that many of y'all who know Japanese maples think, wow, I, I can't believe they said take it out of the bag. But we all the time get photos from customers who email us and they say, I've, you know, I've had this tree for two weeks and I don't know what's wrong with it. Mm -hmm. And the bag's still around the base of the tree in the pot. Right. And so that plant's not able to dry out like it should 
and it starts to cause issues over time. And by taking it out of the bag, letting it dry out a little bit, putting in the shade to get it acclimated a little bit into the area and giving it some water just to make sure that it gets a good amount of water. Mm -hmm. That's a great way to start off your Japanese maple if you've just got it mail order in the mail from us. Yeah. uh, One more thing I'd like to stress here. We could always throw this down into things to avoid, but Japanese maples aren't indoor plants. They don't want to be indoor plants. They're naturally an outdoor plant. Uh, indoors, it's kind of tricky. Like what, what zone is your indoor location? You may, uh, run air conditioning a little bit more than I do in my house, or you may be hotter than we are in this location. So people will say, can I grow Japanese maples indoors? And I often give them the Chris Rock joke. Like you can drive a car with your feet, but don't make it a great idea. It, It can be done, but it's not ideal because your Japanese maple needs that dormancy period. So, uh, I recommend, you know, growing Japanese maples outdoors. Don't try growing them as indoor plants. They're going to be much happier, much healthier, and uh, don't leave them inside too long either. You want to protect them from freezes when you get a plant in, you know. But other than that, let's get these outdoors and get them in the ground. They're going to be so much easier when planted than really any other step. Now, we'll do a whole deep dive on growing Japanese maples in containers. We're going to be talking today about planting them next. And uh, planting Japanese maples, I would say the very first thing to think about there, I touched on it a little bit, but is good drainage. I mean, you, you beating a dead horse here if you've ever heard me talk anywhere but Japanese maples do not want to be in boggy or wet feet. Uh, good drainage is paramount amongst anything else. So if you're starting out with a location that's staying soggy or wet, you've got the wrong location for your Japanese maple. You're going to need to relocate that uh, before you even get in the ground because you're just going to have to move it later. I think the grumpy gardener, Steve Bender, even talked about when we had a customer who asked us last week about growing Japanese maples in red clay because we have that so much in the south. Even planting in red clay mm-hmm. – all you do is you dig the hole wider. You don't dig it too much deeper because you don't want it to settle too much. And you let that plant get established in the native soil as quickly as possible. Yeah. I mean, they've done a lot of research that has proven that trees already have the nutrients and stuff they need in the red clay and yeah. the soil that's out there. You've already got trees growing out there, right? I mean, there's already trees in the landscape there's already good stuff in your soil. There's already good stuff in your soil. Mm -hmm. And if you go out there and you buy a lot of artificial soil that's titled soil conditioner Mm -hmm. or, you know, special potting mix, you, that actually has less nutrients in it than red clay and these other soils. It's already in your ground. So it's great if you're starting out with a soil conditioner to really blend that in heavily, especially if you're in a red clay environment, those things can be additives. They can increase the drainage. Really, the thing you want to look at is when you dig a hole, is that hole holding water? And if that hole is holding water, you're definitely going to have to increase your drainage. So aged pine bark is a great way to increase that drainage and make your soil drain better. Uh, you know, planting slightly higher, you're going to definitely need to be planting in a high, slightly higher location or a raised bed if that that contain, if that uh, hole is holding water. Now, uh, it is a garden myth we like to dispel because there actually are more nutrients and micronutrients in that red dirt clay than there are in any of our man-made synthesized soils, basically, that we create that grow in bags. And we, bring, we don't grow in bags, but we bring them in, in bags for grow bags. And uh, Often the people who are selling you the soil to plant, to use to plant your plants, mm-hmm. are often have a motivation to sell you <laughs> right. that product. And so it's not always better than what's already out there. So keep that in mind. Um, Japanese maples are extremely adaptable, so they can grow in a wide range of soils. They do prefer prefer more acidic soils. So more acidic soils, a plant will get established quicker Mm -hmm. out in the landscape and do fantastic. It's real simple when planting a Japanese maple, though. You should dig the hole about one and a half times bigger than the container that it's coming in, and that's wider. And when you do that, you want to plant the level that the plant is already in, in the pot. Mm -hmm. So you want to take that tree out of the pot, look and see where the top of that soil line is and put that at the very top of the soil or even slightly raised, slightly raised is even better. Japanese maples love drainage. And if you give them that drainage when you're planting your Japanese maple, it's going to really help them out because wet feet is one of the top killers of Japanese maples. Oh, couldn't agree more. And so that soil conditioner can be useful in that condition where you need to increase your acidity or you need to increase your drainage, but it's not necessary. So uh, take these things into consideration when you're picking a location. That's really the first thing. Raised beds work great. 
Now, you don't want to have Japanese maples up against plants that are going to require a lot more water because those Japanese maples do need very well-drained soil. So if you're planting a Japanese maple in a raised bed and you're putting a bunch of annuals below it and those annuals require a ton of extra water, well, you're going to be fighting an uphill battle because that Japanese maple does not want soggy, wet feet. Yeah, we see that so often where people put something in there that requires so much more water than the Japanese maple, and they're sitting there because their petunias are looking puny, mm-hmm. giving them water, and they're overwatering their Japanese maple, and they don't realize that they're damaging their Japanese maple, which, you know, the Japanese maple is worth so much more than those petunias. Right. I mean, if that becomes a problem, the smarter thing to do is just to pull out the petunias, mm-hmm. right? And uh, we, we often see that happen so frequently, and if you avoid putting something there that's going to require more water, it's definitely going to be something that makes sure that your Japanese maple gets the right amount of water that it actually needs. Now, something else to remember when planting Japanese maples, Japanese maples don't like to be bare-rooted when they're in leaf. So Japanese maples are a tree that you can bare root when they're out of leaf and they're in their dormancy, but it's not recommended. So the more you can keep that root ball intact, typically the better. So I always stress here, uh, if you're going to bare root a Japanese maple, especially if you're going from ground to ground, you only want to move that when it's out of leaf. So if you're planting a Japanese maple, uh, you're only going to want to move one from the ground to another location out of leaf. Now, container to ground can actually happen any time of the year, but when that Japanese maple's in leaf, you don't want to bare root it. It's going to have more transpiration. The tree's going to lose more moisture. Those roots that were feeding that upper part are going to be you know, struggling because they're not going to have the energy they had. The microfibrous roots are going to get disturbed, and some of that leaf are going to get droopy. You're probably going to have a little bit of dieback if you're moving a Japanese maple or breaking up the root ball heavily when they're in leaf. And I think people who have experience with some other plants that they can do this with mm-hmm. are a little confused that Japanese maples you don't do this with. Right. And uh, this we see this more often with people who are taking Japanese maples into bonsai pots. Mm-hmm. And they're taking them into the wrong time of the season when the plant is in leaf, disturbing those roots. And that causes a Japanese maple to really almost just drop all of its leaves right away and can kill the Japanese maple. So that's one of the biggest things is not bare rooting a Japanese maple when you're planting it or if you're moving up to an uh, unusual container like a bonsai pot. That is the one of the worst things you can do is try to do that when the plant is in leaf. Now, one of the things I'll say about planting uh, root flare. Here, here's your controversial topic, right? We could, <laughs> we could do a whole hour on root flare. Uh, root flare with Japanese maples is important. I've talked to plant pathologists and scientists who, you know, study these things and root flare is great, but I think too much is made of it. Oftentimes people say you're going to have to create root flare. A lot of that can come about by planting your Japanese maple, not too deep. You want to make sure it's not planted too deeply. You want to not over mulch or over, um, cover that area right around the base, especially on a grafted Japanese maple. You never want to bury that graft. Uh, if you're even close to burying the graft, you've got way too much soil and way too much mulch above your graft, uh, you know, above your soil union. Uh, creating a, uh, you know, that, that, that kind of exposed root system definitely has benefits for Japanese maples. But I can definitely tell you that, you know, the Japanese aren't that busy going out in the forest and uncovering every root system for every Japanese maple. So they certainly can grow and be happy. Uh, you know, my counterpoint to you have to have, uh, you know, a perfect little knuckle there on every single Japanese maple when you're planting it is, I didn't see that when I was walking through the woods in Japan. Yeah, it's, it's about a natural root flare. It's about what the tree naturally develops as you're watering it, mm-hmm. as that plant is taking up nutrients. Those roots are going to grow more and more towards that surface. Mm-hmm. And that natural root flare is what's, what naturally happens. If you're sitting there and you're raking away until you get down to the lower roots, that's not a natural root flare. That is creating a root flare at a lower point, which may at at some point stress your plant out a little bit because it now has to develop that top surface root, what was a lower root that was not exposed. You shouldn't have a full, you know, bonsai-esque nabari on a one-gallon Japanese maple. It depends a little bit on the size tree you're planting. Certainly, you know, that exposed root uh, system can be a healthy point to a Japanese maple. And it certainly can help with the growth and help that those root that root ball get air and not be suffocated. But, you know, there's a lot of ways to develop that. So that tree needs to develop that, especially if you're planting a younger tree. I think a little bit of that talk can be overrated. I, I definitely think you can. Uh, definitely think it can be overrated. 
we see this in all the Facebook groups, people mm-hmm. posting, and they say, where's the root flare? Or, Scratch that out to expose the root flare. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes if a plant is buried too deep in the pot, I, I would understand that. Mm-hmm. Most of the time, they're going to be at where they were naturally should be coming from a nursery. And most <laughs> Nurseries don't just go through and bury all their roots mm-hmm. on their plants. It makes them slower growing. Most of the time, they plant them naturally right towards the top of the pot. And so by going through there and stressing out the plant, by making it change the what was a not exposed root to now a surface root, I, I don't recommend that. Yeah, you'll see you'll see it could be more important on like seven to ten gallon and larger type material or field grown Japanese maples. It's definitely a point to look for. I think too much of it is made with younger trees that haven't developed their full root system yet. And the thing you should really be focusing on there is not planting too deeply and then creating a healthy root system that's going to encourage that good root flare at the top on its own naturally. So next up, we've got watering a Japanese maple. I mean, this is one of the most important things. We touched on a little bit earlier, but people will often say, how much should I water my Japanese maple? The key thing is that you have good drainage and that this plant gets watered and gets a consistent watering and not just watering every single day and not letting it dry out. I hear some growers say this and they say, and it never, it's always never made sense to me. I've heard growers say Japanese maples don't want to be always wet, but they want to be continually moist. I hear people say that a lot. And I'm like, I don't know what that means at all. The the truth of the matter is Japanese maples don't want to be in boggy or wet feet. So they want to dry out pretty much completely in between watering. So you want to saturate that root ball completely and then let that tree dry out fairly full. I mean, you want, you don't want it to get to the point where it's crispy, but you want that tree to dry out well in between waterings. And this is going to create a very healthy cycle where those roots go in search of moisture. They expand that root ball. You're creating a healthier overall plant because it's not staying stagnant and soggy. The worst thing that you could ever do with a Japanese maple is stay stagnant and soggy. You're going to set up phytophthora and root rot. You're going to expose the tree to damages that are going to lead, you know, to so many more issues down the road. You're going to attract more insects you're going to attract all kinds of problems because the Japanese maple staying too wet. So that's really the number one thing to avoid. Uh, I've had people tell me, you know, I don't know what's wrong with my Japanese maple. I, I put a water hose on it for an hour every single day. And I'm like, that's a seven gallon tree. You can't drink water for an hour every single day. So your Japanese maple shouldn't either. Now there are a lot of factors here as well. So uh, while people look for a simple one size fits all answer, There's a lot of different heat conditions. Again, Japanese maples grow zones five through zones nine just here on the East Coast. So a very hot zone nine is definitely going to require more water than somewhere with a shadier condition that's, you know, not evaporating. The water's not going away as quickly. And so one of the things we we definitely recommend is that touch test, especially with young plants. You want to make sure that they're getting watered, but then drying out pretty well. Don't be afraid to stick your finger down that root ball and test that water because the worst thing you can do is be overwatering. Yeah, if you're a gardener, you've already dug this plant, planted this plant, you've got your fingers dirty, right? So now it's time to take that finger and really do that finger test. Like people do with babies, they stick them in the diaper to see. If I don't poop. do that. I've got kids. I don't know what you're talking about. I've got three kids. I don't go stick my finger in any diapers. <laughs> That's how you end up with the wrong situation going on. But you take that finger and you stick it in the soil to see if it's dry or not. If it's moist, you know that that plant doesn't need extra water right now. And everybody's soil is different. I mean, if you look around, some people have more sandy soils. Some people have more clay-based soils. Every soil is different. And by st- using the finger test, you can figure out if your soil, no matter what type it is, if it's getting dry, too dry or if it's too wet. And that's really the best thing you can do in figuring out watering your Japanese maple. Now, watering is different in the springtime versus the summer versus the fall. I mean, if you're watering a plant in the springtime, they're going to require more water. And the reason that is is because they are constantly putting on new growth. And when they're in those seasons of growth, when they're putting on lots of new growth and lots of root growth, they're going to need more water during the spring and during the summer. And when you have the summer, you've got more heat. And so a plant is going to require a lot more water during those summer months Mm -hmm. than it does during the fall. Now, something to definitely be conscious of, you know, Japanese maples, like I said, do better outdoors. Uh, In containers in zone five, you're going to need to protect your Japanese maples. These are going to work zones 
six through nine in the you know uh, in containers. In zone five, you're going to have to protect those containers. Now, even sometimes when we plant Japanese maples, they may be somewhere that doesn't get a lot of natural water. So even in the soil, it may not be receiving the appropriate amount of water. We're going to need to water a little bit even out of leaf. Japanese maples need that for their health. They need that for the rigidity of the bark. It's going to help that, that tree continue to thrive. What we do here at our nursery, we actually have our Japanese maples in cold frames that are unheated. But we actually water once to twice a month, even out of leaf. So we water... Once or twice a, twice a month, very thoroughly, we're getting that root ball completely saturated and letting it dry out completely. That's Again, we're doing this typically when we're above freezing, obviously for the water, but also for the health of the tree. That's going to give you a healthier overall tree if they're not staying soggy and wet. Japanese maples do not like to be wet, but they especially do not like to be wet in the cold months. Yeah, that's a great point, Matt. If you're watering too much during the, the cold months, you know, that plant wants to make sure that it dries out. And Japanese maples, they really like to have that moisture where they just go through those processes of getting wet and drying out and getting wet and drying out. And when you think about planting Japanese maple, that's what exactly what we want you to think. You want it to get wet and dry out. And we've repeated this a lot, but this is one of the number one mistakes people make when growing Japanese maples is watering. Most of the time when we get emails that are coming in saying, hey, what's going on? It's a watering issue. Mm-hmm. And sometimes too much water and too little water can look very similar. Yeah, it's a tricky thing because they definitely can have very similar traits. I mean, keeping a Japanese maple too dry can often look just like keeping a Japanese maple too wet. A lot of times in the summer, if you're keeping your Japanese maple too wet, it's going to have that dry appearance. It's going to look like it got hit a little bit with a lighter on the edges. And uh, that that can create a very similar habit for too, too dry. So uh, I know it almost frustrates people sometimes because – you look at it and you know it's a water issue and you say, I know that this tree is either being too wet or too dry. And they're like, well, which one is it? And it's like, well, you're going to have to figure that part out. Only you can tell me if you've been overwatering this or underwatering it. But too wet and too dry can look very, very similar. And Matt mentioned this and touched this a little bit earlier, but if you are overwatering your Japanese maple, it causes way more issues than giving it just a little too little water. Too much water is a much bigger issue because you can cause long-term damage to the plant Mm -hmm. and you can start attracting bugs, insects, diseases, and things that can really damage the plant. The plant can even release hormones that make it stressed and attract things like deer and other things to come try to munch on your Japanese maple when a healthy Japanese maple that's out there vigorously growing wouldn't always attract the animals and bugs the same. So next up, we've got fertilizing Japanese maples. And this is one of the most important things with Japanese maples. We often see this done too much with people over fertilizing Japanese maples. So fertilizing Japanese maples is one of the most common questions we get. How much should I fertilize my Japanese maple? When should I fertilize my Japanese maple? And we're going to cover all that. With fertilizers, there are three main numbers. So uh, you have an NPK, that first number being your nitrogen, Now, we find this to be the most important number there in the equation. Japanese maples don't like too much nitrogen, and too much residual nitrogen can lead to a lot of issues as well. Yeah, too much nitrogen can actually lead to causing a stretched-out cambium, which can cause a lot of issues, can cause damage during the winter, can cause a lot of issues to the diseases, being able to be more susceptible to them. Um, Too much nitrogen can do a lot of things to Japanese maples, like cause them to be too active in the fall, and cause damage that way. So too much nitrogen, we're talking, you want to fertilize a Japanese maple with something 15 or under. 10, 10, 10 is a great fertilizer. Uh, That's something that we do recommend. But again, it's a springtime thing because often these fertilizers are time released. And so you want to check your packaging to see how long is your fertilizer going to be releasing. I mean, some of these are 180 day releases. So if you're releasing them in July or August, mm. it's going to be pushing them way too long in the season. So if you're fertilizing them in, in March, you know, that might work in your zone. I know that's a lot of times when we're putting out 180 day releases sometime in late February, early March. And so the, the key thing with the nitrogen is not over fertilizing. I mean, over fertilizing too, if you put too much fertilizer on the Japanese maple can act almost like a weed killer. I mean, yeah. I remember dad was at local tailgate markets and we'd go out and sell Japanese maples. And there was a guy who bought a butterfly 
And he bought this butterfly, Japanese maple, and had it out there in his landscape and garden. Came to dad and said, hey, what's wrong with this thing? And dad came to his house, checked out the, the butterfly, and the guy had put a whole bag of triple phosphates mm-hmm. underneath the tree. And this one little small Japanese maple, might have been a three-gallon. Yeah, it was sitting on a hot spot. <laughs> yeah, it was sitting on a bag of fertilizer. And so he overflies, fertilized the Japanese maple and made it drop all of its leaves. Mm-hmm. And dad ended up pulling that Japanese maple up, taking it home, and getting it to relief back out by washing all of its roots and saving the plant. Not something I'd recommend at all. I mean, it was it was a life or death situation for that butterfly Japanese maple, and it's it survived. But it acts as a weed killer if you give too much nitrogen. And that's actually what weed killer is, is it makes the plant grow too much too fast where the plant can't handle it, and it kills the plant. So keep that in mind. If you over-fertilize a Japanese maple, it can act just like a weed killer, and it can kill your Japanese maple. So... We're actually here in Western North Carolina. We're in zone 6B here where our nursery is located. We're actually filming this in October. We're actually shooting this in October. So even next week, we're going to be getting down to close to 28 degrees here locally. So we've cut off all of our fertilizer after May. That's generally our rule here at our nursery. You know, you could take that and kind of make a measurement for your area. We are typically going completely dormant by the second week in November. That's typically our time frame for when our Japanese maples have dropped leaf. We don't want to be creating excess growth that's staying too active going into those winter months. So by doing that properly and not fertilizing too late into the season, especially with granulated slow release mixes, we can create healthier, happier Japanese maples that are going to winterize better and they're going to do much better in especially some of these colder zones. You know, we garden here in zone 6B. Japanese maples even work in zone 5. But I think sometimes what gives Japanese maples a bad name are over-fertilized Japanese maples. And you can find those sometimes at big box stores because we could get a six-foot blood good in a year. But the problem is it wouldn't be acclimated and the cell walls would be stretched too thin from too heavy of a fertilizer. So it wouldn't winter quite as well as a more adequately, properly grown one that hadn't been over-fertilized. A tree that hadn't been over-fertilized is going to do so much better in those winter months It's going to be so much more durable and so much more resistant to natural diseases that it's going to be far superior of a plant. So it may take a little bit longer to get a Japanese maple to that six-foot size range, but you're going to have a tree that's going to be around for over 100 years then. You're going to have a healthy, happy plant that's going to be given everything it can to thrive and just be super successful. Let's talk about plants in sort of common terms. A Japanese maple has arteries that take up nutrients and water from the roots and take them all the way to the leaves. You know, this is how the plant takes up water. It takes up fertilizer. And if you take this Japanese maple and you stretch out those arteries, they're going to be smaller. They're going to be pushing more stuff to a, through a smaller artery. And when you're doing that, you're causing issues. I mean, that's how people have heart attacks. And If you have a Japanese maple that's been over-fertilized and stretched out those cell walls and stretched out those arteries and making it more difficult on that plant as it gets bigger, Mm -hmm. when you have those cold snaps that come in, your plant's going to get damaged significantly more. When you have those heat spells, it's going to struggle more in those hot parts of the summer. And so by making sure that you have a Japanese maple that's been fertilized responsibly, you're going to have a Japanese maple that's going to thrive and do well in your landscape and garden. Yeah, uh, what we use is very close to a 1586. Um, now that that works pretty well for what we do. We try to keep those other numbers in balance. Um, I will say that oftentimes the Japanese maple fertilizers people are sold don't do a lot. I see a lot of fertilizers that are popular for Japanese maples that are like a 444 or like a 243 and things like that. And uh, I mean, you're naturally getting enough nitrogen in your soil typically from leaf drop that it's going to, you know, your leaves are going to be more fertilizer than some of that stuff. Uh, there's a, and other natural fertilizers in the soil. I, I, I don't know that you're actually benefiting yourself worth the money you're paying. If you're fertilizing with something that low Japanese maples don't require a lot of fertilizer, especially a healthy, happy Japanese maple. It's not something we go around and fertilize, especially in a 15 year established plant. It's not something we're typically going out and using a lot of fertilizers on. So it's not something that you need to do every single year. Smaller, young plants, it's great to give them a little bit of a start 
and get them established and get that root ball intact and get it really good and established. But fertilizers long term are not something you have to do. It's not a requirement for Japanese maples. It's always good to make sure a soil has good nutrients in that soil. And you can do this a lot of ways. Like we're talking a little bit about granulated mixes. You know, other ways people fertilize are natural fertilizers. Some of those can be super high in nitrogen. So if people will tell me about these mixes they create or especially like manure teas and things like that. And they're way too high in nitrogen. I mean, your nitrogen's off the charts. It's not even charting on our system right now for that, that amount of nitrogen. Um, liquid fertilizers can be pretty good. You have to be careful there that you're not overdoing it with that and creating a nitrogen buildup. That, that can actually hurt your tree long term if you're using liquid fertilizers too frequently. And uh, it's just things to be cautious of when doing Japanese maples. You know, I know a lot of people are really into natural fertilizers like fish emulsion and kelp. And those can be great in short term amounts. The thing is, you don't want to do those repetitively. So you don't want to be doing too much kelp because it can lead to a salt buildup long term in a container or in a small area garden. You want to make sure that you're not overdoing any one fertilizer for sure. Especially with fish emulsion. Uh, fish emulsion pushes out a large amount of growth really quickly. And with that fish emulsion too, long term, it can actually build up a toxicity to the Japanese maples. So be very, very careful when fertilizing your Japanese maples with fish emulsion. One, because they're super high in nitrogen. And two, because of that toxicity that can happen if you're continually doing it every single time you're fertilizing. I think that was a great point you brought up about the fertilizers that are often labeled Japanese maples for Japanese maples. Because often what you're getting when you get that is less of what you're paying for, but a higher price because it says Japanese maple on it. And so something like a 10, 10, 10, you can often find in a lot of places that is not overpriced. And it's something that can grow the Japanese maple at a reasonable amount. J.D. Veritreese, who wrote the book on Japanese maples, actually says in his book, that you don't need to fertilize Japanese maples. Mm -hmm. And you really don't need to fertilize Japanese That's maples. Correct. But whenever you're growing a Japanese maple, they do grow faster and they do grow better if you give them some fertilizer. The trick is fertilizing responsibly. I mean, responsible fertilizing is one of the most important things because over-fertilizing can lead to diseases, it can lead to damage from winter damage, mm -hmm. it can lead to stressed out plants, and it can really lead to a plant crashing because those cell walls are stretched out too, th too thin. And making sure that you're doing this responsibly, that's the key thing with fertilizing Japanese maples. Yeah, liquid fertilizers can be great too. Uh, I'm a big fan of liquid fertilizers. They're great for picking a plant up that may have gotten stressed for some other reason. It's something we recommend a lot here when a Japanese maple might have gotten too hot in a container and started to drop leaf or something and we want to pick it back up in the summer. You want to be conscious of not doing that too late into the season and too repetitively. It's not something you want to do too frequently. Uh, you can have some of the same issues, but liquid fertilizers do work well. You know, like something like even miracle Grow, which everybody's familiar with as a liquid fertilizer, that can work great for your Japanese maples. Again, you just need to get it on the root ball. I've had people put it on the, the, the actual plant. No need to have it actually on the foliage. Uh, there are foliar sprays and all kinds of things you can do. But Japanese maples love moderation. That That's really the main thing there. Any, any of your fertilizers you want to do, Keep it to a minimum. Fertilize in early spring if you want to fertilize your Japanese maple, and then keep it to a minimum. I don't recommend filling a, uh, you know, a fall planting hole full of granulated mixes. You're going to be giving it too much nitrogen in those winter months, and uh, you're just keeping that root ball too active too, which is going to, in turn, make your Japanese maple be more susceptible to cold snaps. So when those cold snaps happen, you're going to be way more likely to have cracking bark because the sap's high in the plant. You're going to be way more likely to have issues. And so avoiding uh, over-fertilizing and fertilizing at the wrong times, those are our main tips for fertilizing Japanese maples. So lastly, we've got pruning Japanese maples. This is a question we get constantly. When should I prune my Japanese maple? How should I prune my Japanese maple? And there's a lot of easy tips. Uh, I think Matt always talks about our good friend, Buddy Lee. Yeah, he had a great, great explanation for this. It was the exact same way I always say it. But hearing him saying it, it just it just reiterated it. Buddy's famous for naming the Encore azaleas. And these woody ornamentals go by some of the same principles as Japanese maples. Uh, so with, with Japanese maples, you only want to prune Japanese maples in times when you could fertilize. That That's going to give you the best success rate. And again, we only want to fertilize typically in early spring. So we prune early spring right before our trees are leafing out. That's going to give you your highest heal rate. It's going to not open your tree up to... 
uh, bacteria going into the winter months because it's going to heal at a much faster pace. But also be conscious that pruning Japanese maples do create new growth. So that's something we don't want to do going into the fall. Uh, oftentimes here people give pruning advice and they're telling people to prune their Japanese maples in the fall or in the dead of winter. And that's actually something we don't recommend here at Mr. Maple. And uh, that can be quite controversial too. People completely disagree with it. Now, it's not that if you did it once, your tree's dead. It's all, all's gone wrong because uh, I'm sure there's a, a husband out there who's scared right now. His wife's looking cross-eyed at him that we've said the wrong time to prune a Japanese maple. But pruning a Japanese maple will activate it. So I don't like to prune in the dead of winter because you are activating the sap in that tree. It's going to create uh, the sap coming up higher into those branches and it's going to activate some of that foliage simply by that sap level rising. And it's something I like to do mid to late March here in Western North Carolina. Now that can vary a little bit depending on where you're at and you're listening to this, but it's something you want to do right before the tree leaves out. That's going to give you your best success rate for not activating it going into winter, going into a cold snap or at the wrong time. Now, when we make a prune, we make a cut on a Japanese maple you're basically performing a surgical procedure. We got to make sure that our pruners are extremely clean. A mistake that I often see someone do is they use the same pruners that have never been washed, never mm. been cleaned, that they've been running around pruning out all the dead wood yeah. around their garden out with. And what's happened sometimes is they may be spreading something from one plant to another plant when they're out there pruning. Now, Say there was something on a plant, and that's the reason why it's dead. Now you've taken a cut on that, and you're pruning on a healthy Japanese mm. maple. You may be spreading what your what was on that other plant that caused the dead wood to your Japanese maple. Yeah, and that's such a great point. So whenever you have these pruners that have been dirty from all these usage, make sure that you're cleaning them. You can take something like rubbing alcohol or a 10% bleach solution, and you can take it with a rag and just clean your pruners. And that can help avoid spreading any issues from plant to plant. You know, if you're going around pruning, it's really smart to go around and actually take your rubbing alcohol and a rag out there with you to clean your pruners bef between plants. Mm -hmm. That way you're not spreading anything. And this applies to saws. This applies to large pruners. This applies to anything you're making cuts with on your plants. It's the smartest way to do it is to be clean with your pruning, and that's one of the biggest mistakes we've seen. We've seen garden centers before go around and literally spread stuff to everything in their garden center because they didn't know better. Mm -hmm. And they're out there pruning with the same pruners on all the plants. So that's something to be very cautious about, and just make sure you're clean with your actual tools that you're using. So one thing I always like to get in is why are you pruning your Japanese maples? So a lot of people send me photos of Japanese maples. Uh, I'll get pictures from our website, from people sending in, they'll say, I've got this Japanese maple and I just don't know what to do with it. I really need to prune it. And they'll send me a picture of a gorgeous Japanese maple. And I'm like, I don't think you need to prune that at all. That looks beautiful. Like this is an upright tree. This has got a very nice approach to it. And so you really need to be cautious of why you're pruning it. You don't just have to prune it to prune it. Uh, Japanese maples are an easy plant to prune. If you take the right steps, you do it at the right time. You can actually take out a good amount, and the heal, tree's going to heal at a very quick pace. And, and that's going to give you the best success rate for pruning one. But oftentimes people will send me pictures of trees, and they'll say, I feel like I really need to prune this tree because pruning can be a sore spot for a lot of people. It's something people either intimidated to do or they feel this obligation to do it. And it's not always something that has to be done. Yeah, exactly. Do you have to prune your Japanese maple? And the answer is no. I mean, when it comes to Japanese maples – you can train and shape them to however you like. Mm -hmm. and that's one of the great things about Japanese maples is they're really easy to train and to shape into whatever picture that you have in your head you want it to look like. Mm -hmm. When you're dealing with a Japanese maple that has a weeping habit, it's real easy to train and shape that to have those really bonsai-esque weeping habits that you see at like the Portland Japanese Garden. Mm -hmm. Those amazing photos people will take of the Japanese maples there. I mean, you can prune Japanese maples to have these amazing shapes but Japanese maples naturally have amazing shapes all by themselves. If you're going out to a lot of arboretums, many arboretums don't do much pruning at all on their mm -hmm. Japanese maples. And the Japanese maples have been out there for years and years and are thriving and still look very, very beautiful all on their own. 
So this gets back a little bit to choosing the right Japanese maple. We talked about it a step there, but if you're trying to prune an upright tree to be a weeping form, you're fighting a losing battle. So if you've already picked the right tree, that's going to put you ahead. Now, the same can be said for pruning. So if you're going to prune a Japanese maple, it's a good idea to know a little bit about what that cultivar wants to form. And then you can accentuate those traits with your pruning. So you wouldn't want to prune a lace leaf to be an upright, and you wouldn't want to prune an upright to be a lace leaf. But by knowing that you have a mid-sized dwarf, you can kind of accentuate those traits to make the best looking plant for that specific cultivar. And that gets back into a little bit about, you know, the breed of dog. So if you're starting out with a Great Dane, you can't turn it into a Chihuahua and vice versa. You can pick the right cultivar. And by knowing a little bit about those traits, research the cultivar. If you're growing a Kamigata, you're going to want to grow that like a Kamigata, not necessarily like an upright, large specimen tree. And you can actually go on mrmaple.com and go look through our photos. Often you can only see three photos at a time on our website, but you can click on an arrow and look at more, the arrow to the right or to the left, and look at more photos on our website. And many of our Japanese maples, there may be, you know, 20 or 30 different photos on some of our, our varieties. So you'll get the opportunity to look and see on many types a full specimen out there in the landscape and garden. So you have an idea of the shape that this tree is going to make and the shape that you can prune to accentuate, not necessarily prune to shape, but prune to accentuate because these trees have a natural habit all by themselves. Yeah. Now, one thing to take into consideration here, uh, we mentioned that pruning Japanese maples in early spring is the best time. Now, this is the best time for any major changes, but pruning in early spring is going to increase the growth rate of your Japanese maple. It actually is going to be like a natural fertilizer. You're actually going to have a larger tree by pruning it in the springtime. Now, with the bonsai guys do, they actually prune late summer, and that's taking energy away from your plant. You can do that in small amounts. You don't want to do that in large amounts. Any major changes you're still going to need to do during that springtime because they heal so much quicker during that time frame. So when you're starting out pruning, you want to start out pruning the branches you don't like on your Japanese maple. And if the branches are already kind of big, it's only going to get bigger. And so sometimes you may need to break out a saw or a larger type pruning mechanism that's make sure it's sharp to make sure that you're making clean cuts, make sure you're, you're, what your tools are clean, and making a, a nice clean cut on your plant itself. People often make the big mistake of saying this branch is too big and then it just gets bigger and they continually don't like it. Japanese maples are there for you to enjoy. Gardening is about having fun and enjoying it out there. And if it's a branch that you don't enjoy, get rid of it. Yeah, you're going to take that energy out. You're going to put it in to the parts you do like. You're going to accentuate the parts of the tree you do like. Now, something I often tell people, too, you have to let the tree form a little bit of its natural characteristics. So it, you have to have something started to then accentuate as your art form. So I don't prune on Japanese maples until they've been in the ground at least two to three years, especially if I plan that as a one gallon. You can kind of get a little bit more character started and you can figure out where you want to start making a break and growing that tree. Sometimes by pruning it at too young of an age, you can kind of stun it back a little bit. And we often have people who ask us whenever they have a Japanese maple that may have multiple trunks coming up, should I prune off one of the trunks on a one gallon? And the answer to that is, well, not right yet. Um, Japanese maples are so different. Often people will have a Japanese maple out in the landscape mm -hmm. and they'll try to turn it into like a street tree form yeah. where they have an upright that's got one single trunk and then breaks and then... I think as Americans, we want everything to be symmetrical. You know, we, we tend to, American pruning, we tend to create street trees that are very symmetrical. And it's one of the things that we learned a lot about going to Japan and looking at what was, you know, the more expensive trees, what were the more sought after trees, what were the trees that were placed at temples, uh, what were the trees that were growing naturally in the landscape. And those are typically trees with more characteristics indicative of that cultivar or that seedling, that individual characteristic. Not every single tree needs to be perfectly symmetrical. And with Japanese maples, they really shouldn't be. I mean, part of the beauty in Japanese maples are how unique they are. And so you really shouldn't seek to create this, like, perfectly symmetrical. I know, I know a lot of times in American gardening, this is our mentality. We're going we're gonna to stake this tree to the perfect shape, and we're going to cut every branch so that each branch has the perfectly matching side to it. And uh, that's really not what Japanese maples are all about. Yeah, and I think Japanese maples naturally form a more symmetrical shape, mm -hmm. but they don't always do it where it matches perfectly. I mean, like the overall structure may look very symmetrical, yeah. but the branches to get there aren't. And 
that's one of the things that's so cool about Japanese maples. And when they have multiple trunks coming up, in Japan they call that the mountain style. Yeah. And that is what is highly prized. That's what's planted at the temples. Oh, yeah. And, and so there's not really a wrong way to have two trunks or three trunks or one trunk af- past the graft on a Japanese maple. There's no one way that's better than the other. I mean, some people have their own vision, and mm-hmm. your own vision is your vision. I mean, if you want a single trunk, you can definitely prune it to have a single trunk. But remember that that's going to make it like everybody else's. Yeah. And by having multiple trunks on a Japanese maple, that can give it that unique character that really makes it something special. And you can certainly create a higher break in them, especially especially if it's going to be a plant that's along a walkway. That's something we've done a little bit in our parents' garden where we've kind of, you know, create a little bit higher break in the tree. But don't get too caught up in having everything perfectly symmetrical. I think I think you'll miss the point of that natural beauty. Another pet peeve of mine, and you'll see this at some nurseries, uh, everything gets pruned to be the same exact thing. And it gets back to the cultivar. You know, it's like, what does a trompenberg look like? Well, it looks like a kiyohime. What does a kamagata look like? Well, it looks like a kiyohime. What does a makawa yetsubusa look like? Well, it looks like a kiyohime. And everything's kind of pruned in the same, you know, dense pattern, aesthetic. And you need to look at the cultivar and what it wants to do naturally and then accentuate those traits. So that's that's really paramount before anything else. You know, look at what this wants to be and then find ways to enhance those natural characteristics. Now, if you're pruning a Japanese maple to try to make it grow quicker, one of the things you can do is prune out the twiggier, smaller branching. When you prune out this twiggier, smaller branching, it puts more energy into the larger, thicker branching, and in effect, it gets larger growth quicker. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of different ideas here. With upright Japanese maples, I tend to leave a central leader. Uh, I want that to be the uppermost part and tell the tree, hey, we've got a lot of growth going on here. Encourage growth by trimming out twiggier growth that you're going to push that central leader to be that beacon for growth, especially on an upright tree. Now, that's going to be very different for a lace leaf. By taking out that twiggier growth, you're going to create longer shoots. You know, it's going to get a lot of uh, new growth in areas that have good, healthy buds. So those healthy buds, you can see that's going to be driving your next set of branches. And that's where the new growth is going to be coming, especially when you're taking out these twiggier, smaller branching uh, and really just putting the energy into the strongest parts of the plant. Now, keep in mind, too, if you have a Japanese maple and something happens to your central leader, Japanese maples form a central leader on their own very Mm -hmm. quickly back again. Especially young plants. Especially young plants. Uh, This isn't the case with all plants, but with Japanese maples, you don't have to worry if that central leader gets damaged because it will often form a new central leader very quickly on its own and come right back. So just something to keep in mind with those central leaders. Now, whenever it comes to a Japanese maple, too, you want to look out for conflicting branching. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you have branches that are aimed back towards each other, one, that's taking away from that pleasing effect of the eye where the Japanese maple has that sort of open kind of structure. And two, the branches might start rubbing against each other. And so you often choose between branches that are conflicting and say, which one do I like better? And, you know, both branches, one branch may just be bigger and you think, hey, I'll take out the smaller branch because it's easier. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you look at it and you say, I can develop that smaller branch into something better than that larger branch. So keep that in mind when you have conflicting branches. Really take a moment, step back, and say, which branch do I want to keep? And then prune out the one that you don't want to keep because you can develop the other one into what you want. Now, that's so important, especially with lace leaves. Lace leaves are so amongst the most popular Japanese maples. They're also amongst the most intimidating Japanese maples to prune. I mean, I'm sure many of you listeners know Pearl Fryer. Pearl has uh, an amazing topiary garden there in Bishopville, South Carolina, And I was visiting Pearl for the first time, and Pearl has done so many amazing topiaries there. I mean, he's pruned every single plant in his garden. And I walked up to Pearl, and he said, I'm so glad you're here to talk to me about this. Here's the one tree my wife won't let me prune, and it's a Japanese maple. So I got a little chuckle out of that. It's like even Pearl's afraid to prune Japanese maples. Uh, You know, Grumpy was telling us it was a sore spot for him sometimes. Don't be afraid to prune when you do everything right. When you're doing it at the right time, you're following some of these steps, you're going to create a healthier you know, xylem flow in the tree and a healthier overall plant by by giving it a light pruning, especially in that early springtime. Uh, if you're doing it right, a lot of times people send me a picture of their tree they pruned, and I'll say, hey, go back and do it when you're a little bit more angry, <laughs> and then come back and show it to me because that first set of pruning didn't really do anything. So if you're taking out those conflicting branches and those fishtails and that slightly dead wood or that slightly damaged wood, which it's not uncommon, especially in the colder zones, in zones five and six, to get a little bit of tip dieback 
and our colder zones and some of our winters. A little bit of that is na- actually completely natural on Japanese maples, and it always is nice to remove it if you have the time and clean that up, make it look as premium as possible. Now, Matt mentioned fishtails. Now, what we mean by that is when you have a Japanese maple and you've got two branches going to the side and one coming in the middle, you often have an area where it's getting kind of congested because there's so much growth right there. And if you prune out, say, like the center uh, center branch, then you've got those room for the other two branches to grow and develop more. And if you do that, you can encourage a more open, airy habit, which is what people love about having some of those lace leaves with that open, sort of airy, bonsai-esque habit. Mm-hmm. And that's a good way to get that effect to go on. One of my favorite tips for creating a, a great-looking lace leaf Japanese maple from pruning is just to create plateaus. So I'll go in there and create space and then look for areas where I can create more space, basically by taking out conflicting branching. Often, if I'm choosing between two branches, I'll choose the tree that's the lower plant because you're not going to notice that cut. I don't tend to cut my Japanese maple all the way back to that set of buds. I tend to leave a little bit of a sap stump so that that can dry out and fall off. If you cut it back very much deep into it, you can create a little bit of scarring. But by leaving a little bit, it's going to have a little bit of a sap stump that's going to dry back there, but it's going to make the cleanest cut long term. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. That You want to make sure you get as clean as cut as you can. And when you have that, it's going to be something that heals over and really makes the Japanese maple be a healthy plant. You want When you're making cuts, Matt talked about when people try to cut during the fall. You know, it may take a Japanese maple 28 days to heal sometimes during the fall. Mm-hmm. But if you cut them in the early spring, that plant's going to heal in seven to eight days. And so it heals so much faster mm-hmm. when you prune at the times when you, you should prune. Because that's also the time people often graft is the times whenever it, a plant heals the quickest. And with Japanese maples, that's exactly what you're doing. Is you're making a wound on the plant, and it's best so that wound isn't open for a long time. It's best for that to heal as quickly as possible. That avoids pests, disease, and a lot of other things to get into that wound. Now, with Japanese maples, they're extremely a hardy plant. And by taking those cuts in the early spring, it's going to heal and your plant will be able to thrive and do so much better in the landscape. Oh, yeah. Super simple thing to do. Don't be intimidated by pruning. These are some simple steps to follow. Again, you can prune late summer to reduce size. That's a great way to take energy away from your plant. But you only want to do that after all the growth is hardened off. You don't want any soft growth. It's all needs to be harder signs that new growth for the year already needs to be hardened off and more rigid to the touch. And that's going to give you better success You only want to do a minimal amount of pruning it that way, too. That late summer pruning, you want to do the majority of your pruning for structure. If you're going to do any major changes, that early spring is the ideal time because it's going to heal so much quicker. I often hear people say, when I prune in the early spring, that Japanese maple starts to bleed. And that's just the wrong terminology. Yes, the Japanese maple pushes some uh, some sap out when you make the cuts. It's going to bleed out. Yeah, I know. It scares people to death when they say it's going to bleed out. And that's not affecting and hurting your plant at all. That plant is still healing just fine. And that's actually a sign that that plant is in that growing stage and it's going to heal quicker. So with a Japanese maple, you know, this may not apply to all plants, but with the Japanese maple, that is the very best time to prune and shape your Japanese maples. So uh, we'll talk slightly about transplanting. I mentioned a little bit of it before. You know, often one of the biggest mistakes people make is transplanting at the wrong time of the year. Now, if you're moving from your house and you have the most gorgeous Japanese maple ever, sometimes you have to do what you can do, right? I I have those people, my heart goes out to them. They're like, it's getting cut down next week. You know, it's, it's either now or never. I've got to move this tree from one house to the next, and I've got to do it in peak heat. And if you're going to have to do that, you want to keep as much root ball intact but your success goes way down. The ideal situation for transplanting a Japanese maple is when it's dormant. I like to go into that later part of uh, right before they break bud, not quite when the sap's at its highest. Typically late February here for me is the time when I try to transplant. They're still dormant. They're not putting on microfibrous roots. They're not going to be as disturbed, but that spring is right around the corner. You're you're right about to get into that rejuvenation stage. So when you get it in this new location, it's going to be ready to heal and do its best you know, growth and everything right away. 
Now, you want to keep as much root ball intact as possible. That's even in the winter months. You don't want to be breaking up all those microfibrous roots. The more of the root ball you can keep intact and the happier you can keep that root ball, the greater your success goes up for transplanting a Japanese maple. And with Japanese maples, if you're trying to transplant a Japanese maple during the summer, most of the time, it's like a 95% failure rate. I mean, 5% of the time, someone might get away with it if they do everything just right. Especially an old mature specimen. Exactly. You see a lot of damage. You see a tree get set back many, many years because it got stressed. And it can recover, but it just isn't going to look optimal for a while. And again, when we're talking about transplanting, we're talking about taking a plant that's already established in the ground and trying to move it to a pot or to somewhere else in the ground. That is a bad idea. Taking a plant to the ground uh, from a pot, taking a plant from the pot to the ground can be done any time of the year when the ground's not, when the frozen. Ground's not frozen. So keep that in mind. Planting a Japanese maple, you can do any time of the year when the ground's not frozen, but transplanting a Japanese maple, you only want to do when it's dormant, and it's really best done in the early spring. And during that time, you have, instead of a 95% uh, failure rate, you probably have about a 95 success rate. And that's just saying 5% of the time you might make an error. Uh, Japanese maples, they're really easy to grow. Uh, there's just a few things we just want to remind you to avoid with Japanese maples because these are some of the top things we see with Japanese maples. And one of the first ones is that wet feet. I just want to say that again because Japanese maples, they like to get wet and then they like to dry out. Now, when transplanting that Japanese maple, if you have to do it when it's in leaf, remember to keep that root ball intact. Remember that if you can keep as much, what dad always called it digging a donut. So you dig a hole around the tree instead of digging the tree up, and then you would take the tree out. So that root ball would be as intact as possible. That's going to give you your best success rate, even in the winter months, keeping that root ball intact. Uh, a lot of times when people are transplanting, and they're talking about saving an older specimen, Japanese maple. Now, whenever possible, if I know I'm going to be transplanting a larger tree, I'll actually go out there a couple different times during the year, and I'll stamp it out with a spade. And I'll kind of go ahead and start to create that root ball. I'll go ahead and tuck those roots in. So that root ball has already kind of created a more pot-sized container for it. We've already, uh, you know, created a smaller root ball. Those roots have healed several times over, and they've already got more microfibrous roots within that root ball that I'm creating. And then I'll, then the job's already done for me. So then when the winter comes and I'm ready to transplant my Japanese maple, typically, again, I like to do that in February. Uh, that tree's already in a nice little intact size root ball that I can dig up again by digging a donut around the tree and keeping that root ball as intact as possible. And these are just some tips that are going to give you your best success rate when transplanting one. Uh, I, you know, I've seen Japanese maples pulled out by tractors and bare rooted and planted and they've made it. So it certainly can be done, but it's not ideal. Yeah. And if you've moved a Japanese maple, say you've transplanted a Japanese maple, the very best thing you can do is when that spring approaches, since you're doing it in the right time of the season, right? is then give it some vitamin B or kelp. And when you do that, those roots that are those microfibrous roots, we're talking about those very thinly spider-like web-like roots. Those are the roots that are most important for the plant to take up water and nutrients more efficiently. You know, those big, huge, say, tap roots, those roots that are just real woody, those don't give the same amount of water and nutrients to the plant as those really small, fine roots. And with those really small fine roots, when you give them the vitamin B or kelp, it helps promote a lot of those really small fine roots so that your Japanese maple can get established and start taking care of itself again. Now, Japanese maples have very non-invasive root systems. They're not a plant you have to worry about being you know, super invasive by root systems naturally. So they're also not a plant that tends to choke themselves out a lot. I think another thing that's made too much of is breaking up those root balls. It certainly can help a tree that's been kept in a container too long, a tree that's already kind of getting a little root bound, it can help to break up that root ball. But most Japanese maples, if they're repotted or planted at the appropriate time, you're not going to need to really get in there and dig out those roots too much. You're really going to disturb more microfibrous roots than it's worth. And you're going to be taking away more of those microfibrous roots that are feeder roots that are sending, you know, all kinds of moisture back into this plant. And what tends to happen is you've damaged one specific set of that roots well, you're going to see it made up for it in one specific set of that plant. So you're going to have some damage or die back on the top uh, because those roots were feeding that plant. And if you get a plant from us in a one gallon and you're emailing us in July and telling us that it has J-hooking roots, one, it doesn't really matter that much in a one gallon Japanese maple. 
And J-hooking roots is a term that's sort of made up and passed around online. But two, you're doing it in the wrong time of the season. <laughs> so you're going to kill your Japanese maple right. very quickly by bare rooting your Japanese maple. So we get that all the time. It's just something that struck a chord whenever Matt was saying that again. I just wanted to reiterate that. Yeah, people. I've seen people do some horrific things. You know, there's a lot of different plants you can bare root and have good success rates. I'll see people bare root Japanese maples and leaf and wash all the soil off every single root and lay every single root out, poss- you know, flat. And that that can give you success. I mean, I've seen people do it and make it, but you're going to have more damage than not by doing that. You're going to have a better Japanese maple if you don't disturb that root ball a lot and you allow those roots, especially if they're not root bound, to form a nice microfibrous mat below it and fill out itself. And those feeder roots are going to naturally form and develop and just give you way better success if they're not disturbed and torn off. And again, there's a time of the season if you want to dig into the roots, and the time of the root season to do that is not when the plant's in leaf. Um, Japanese maples do not like that. It's the same issue with transplanting. You're messing with those really small fibrous roots, and that's what's going to cause an issue. If those microfibrous roots get damaged and they can't take up water and nutrients, your Japanese maple may crash. So don't do that in the wrong time of the season because Japanese maples are very easy to grow, but we just want to reiterate some of the top things that we see yeah. before we get off today to make sure that you avoid these top issues we see with Japanese maples. Now, we talked a little bit about transplanting. We talked a little bit about planting trees from pots. Uh, one thing I'd like to reiterate here before we move on is that, you know, you can plant a Japanese maple in the ground anytime when the ground's not frozen. We try to avoid when the ground's frozen. Fall is one of the most forgiving times for most zones. You know, zones six through nine, fall is a great time to plant your Japanese maple. By planting in the ground in the fall, you're going to get that tree established. You're going to get a little bit of root growth sometimes. I actually like to go even a little earlier. I like to start in September sometimes, get that root system established. Even if the tree drops leaf or transpires from being planted that time of the year, oftentimes those healthy buds are there and that root system is going to get a little active, you know, in the later part of the season and get a little bit more set in. It's going to give you, you know, that acclimation all winter. So when that tree leaves out in the spring, it's ready to do its thing. Now, I have heard some great pointers for planting your Japanese maples in zone five in the spring. As you can get those roots out there, the younger plants hadn't had to go through that full winter. So I, I do think zone five in the spring is an excellent time to plant your Japanese maples from containers, especially young ones. But these are just some simple tips. And you can actually plant a Japanese maple Anytime when the ground's not frozen. That way you're not damaging those roots. We often end up planting our Japanese maples in the summer here at Mr. Maple because that's one of our times when we actually get a little bit of time to plant here at the nursery. And during the summer, if you water and take care of your plant, the Japanese maples actually get established quicker during the high heat times when it can push out roots and dry out a little faster. So there's some advantages to almost every season. But if you figure out what season works best for you, that's really the best thing to go with when you're planting your Japanese maples. So some things to avoid, and we'll just run through these kind of quick. They're, we've kind of already reiterated, uh, you know, a lot of the steps. Uh, definitely wet feet are something to avoid. You don't want your tree being too wet, soggy all the time. That is by far the number one mistake people make in growing Japanese maples is too wet. Yeah. You want to get it wet, and you want to get it to dry out. Get it wet, and then let it dry out. Next up, we got to make sure that your Japanese maple isn't planted too deep when you're actually doing the actual planting. I mean, if you plant your Japanese maple too deep, you can smother the roots. And that applies also to adding too much mulch around the base of a Japanese maple. If you have that big volcano of death around a Japanese maple, that's the same thing as planting it too deep. I mean, you're going to kill your Japanese maple because it, Japanese maples have a shallow, non-invasive root system. And you start piling all this mulch, it's just like planting it deeper in the soil. Yeah, it's just a very important thing to notice, especially on a grafted Japanese maple. You never want to bury that graft union. I've had people say, oh, it's perfectly fine. You can bury a Japanese maple graft union. What tends to happen is if that cultivar is even one that roots well, which a lot of them don't. Some cultivars don't root very well at all. But say that's a cultivar that does root well. Well, that tree is going to have to re-root and put on roots at the top above that graft. So you've slowed your tree down for many years while you've essentially had to do a rooted cutting on top of a graft. So leave that graft union completely out. You want that graft union exposed on your Japanese maple. A properly grafted Japanese maple is going to clean up and look great long term. And, uh, you know, I did a garden show a couple years ago, and we only had larger stuff. And somebody said, I don't believe any of these Japanese maples are grafted. And I said, you've paid me the best compliment possible. That's exactly what we want it to look like. And uh, so don't bury your graft unions. That's a 
important step there, not planting too deep. And then next, the one of the things we see quite a bit, and there's two sides to this, is people weed eating their Japanese maples. Often you'll have a Japanese someone not going out and weed eating around your yard, and a Japanese maple might be out there in the landscape and garden as a solo tree you've got out there that's really a specimen that's really showing off, giving you some good red color. Um, and what happens is people will get too close to the Japanese maple, mm-hmm. and they strip the bark around the Japanese maple with the weed eater. And that can kill a Japanese maple because the outside of the bark on a Japanese maple is where those arteries are that I talked about earlier that take nutrients from the roots to the top of the plant. And so if you damage that all the way around Mm -hmm. and the plant doesn't have a route to get the water and the nutrients to the top, the top can die. And so that's something that's easy to happen. So if you've got someone out there weeding in your yard, tell them, hey, stay off my Japanese maples. Right. I'll often go and plant, or not plant, but put a small border maybe a tomato cage around young plants, or uh, I'll have a temporary drain that I've cut so I can go put those drains around the base. It's not something I leave on the tree after the weeding's done, but it's a great way to avoid people getting too close to the base of your Japanese maple, stripping that cambium and robbing it of growing time because basically it's going to set that tree back very much. You know, if it's stripped, uh, that cambium, it could set it back a whole lot or it could essentially kill the plant if it's all the way around it. The other thing that is a, the same problem, essentially, is weeds too close to your Japanese maple is when someone goes out there and they're putting weed killer around your yard and you're putting weed killer around your yard and they accidentally spray the bark or the leaves of your Japanese maple, that's going to kill it. I mean, it's, weed killer kills weeds. It will also kill your Japanese maple. Nobody ever believes they did it. <laughs> <laughs> nobody, nobody ever. Like, this is the most, like, it's like people think you've accused them of murder. <laughs> if you bring this up, no, nobody's ever done this yet. It's one of the leading causes of death for Japanese maples that we see in photos. So people will say, there's no way that happened. That That's impossible. There's zero chance there could have been weed killers. And then you'll say, hey, can you send me a photo? And then all the grass around the plant is super brown and all of the weeds are super brown. And it's clearly got a lot of drift. Now, you have to be careful that even with uh, you know a light wind, you want to be doing your weed killers on a day. If you're going to do weed killers, you want to be doing them on a day where there's not a lot of wind, so you're not creating a drift. Because I've seen people spray, you know, in a light wind, and unfortunately, a lot of that that weed killer got blown directly onto their Japanese maple foliage, and they can come back from that depending on the amount of contact. But it's certainly not a good thing, and it's certainly going to set your Japanese maple back. Now. Weed killers have on their label that they need they don't need to be put out when there's a certain mile per hour wind above that uh, amount above a certain amount of miles per hour of wind, but they also have a temperature. And the reason that is is because above a certain temperature, certain weed killers can actually turn into a gas and vaporize up and actually hit the the plants above it. So if you're weed killing everything down below a Japanese maple, but it's above that certain temperature, Mm -hmm. it can actually turn into a a gaseous weed killer and actually hit your Japanese maple above that. And that's one thing that people don't realize as well. And it's really important to follow your labels on your Japanese maples. And when you're putting weed killer out, stay away from your Japanese maples. I can't say that enough. People on a windy day will go out and put weed killer, and that's not the time to do it. I have a customer who, who was shopping at the nursery, and he said, you know, I put weed killer on a day just like today. And he's sitting here smoking a cigarette and the cigarette smoke is blowing. I said, do you see your cigarette smoke? And he's like, oh goodness, I yeah. killed my Japanese maple. It's often something people don't realize. It seems too simple. And I know some people get annoyed that we even bring it up because they're like, duh. But it's actually one of those things that's good to look into. Uh, it is one of the leading causes we see for damage in Japanese maples. And oftentimes people... You know, they, they deny, deny, deny at first. They're like, there's no way. And then they're like, you know, I had my nephew putting out weed killer last week, and uh, maybe I didn't lay the parameters out correctly. Because when they actually think it through a little bit, it's a very distinct look, and it's a very – you can almost put it on the calendar. It's a it's a thing that starts to happen right at the first of summer when we're getting into those drier spells as people start to get into that weed killer season. And maybe they have somebody doing their lawn care that isn't familiar with the importance of Japanese maples – or they have a high graft. I've seen that a lot, and they're spraying around the base like it doesn't matter. Uh, you got to be very careful of those things. They can cause undue damage. Uh, but, you know, it's a simple thing to avoid. Just make sure that you're setting parameters for that uh, if that's something you're doing. 
and be very careful with that. Uh, again, we talked about don't over fertilize. That kind of goes hand in hand with that. Don't over fertilize your Japanese maples. You're going to open them up to more winter damage. You're going to make them more susceptible to all these other problems if you're overwatered and over fertilizing. Japanese maples are a very simple plant to grow. Uh, it's one of those plants that sometimes the least you do the better. People will tell me, I can't grow a Japanese maple. I don't have a green thumb. And I'm like, yeah, you really can. Oftentimes the tree somebody put out beside the driveway and forgot about, that one looks amazing. And the one that's gotten a little bit too much love, the one that's gotten a little bit too much worried about, people go, oh gosh, I, you know, I've got to take extra care of this Japanese maple. It's a, maybe they paid a little bit more for it. Maybe it was a really special plant to them. Maybe it was a, you know, a very important plant. And so they put too much attention to that plant and it's caused undue stress because they've overwatered, they've over fertilized. They've done too many steps that they don't really need to be doing with Japanese maples. And oftentimes that tree that's just planted and let it do its thing. Once it's planted correctly, let it do its thing. And wow, I mean, they can make some amazing plants that are very, very low maintenance. These top tips to avoid, I think there's things that can really be applied to a lot of different plants, but people often do this with the Japanese maple and the Japanese maple is the more expensive plant. And so that's the thing that they care about the most. And they see that got killed by the weed eater or they see that got killed by the weed killer. I mean, these things kill plants and they can kill a lot of different plants. So it's good to realize that these are top issues that can happen to your Japanese maple. They're easy things to avoid but you just got to make sure that you avoid them because we see this every single day. Japanese maples are super low maintenance. It really is one of those plants that the least do the better. Um, you can avoid those steps and with some simple, you know, common sense tips to, to grow in these things, you definitely want to uh, prepare for extreme changes. I always let people know, you know, you want to, people say, well, it's only getting this cold. Do I need to protect my Japanese maple? My, my answer is always yes, because I care a lot about Japanese maples. I do this for a living. I'm passionate about Japanese maples. And I normally tell people, if, you, if you're asking me that question, then the answer is probably yes. But you don't want to make things more complicated than they need to be. A lot of times people will put a, you know, a tarp or something over their Japanese maple because they're worried about it wintering, and they'll leave it there all year. And they've caused so much more problems for that Japanese maple by wrapping it in burlap or something like that than it needed to be done. Now, that's not to say that if you're having a polar vortex in your area or a late freeze or a late frost, you shouldn't protect your trees. It's always important to protect, you know, bring small trees in. If you're having extreme weather changes, be conscious of things that could have changed in your yard. I've seen things where neighbors have had a neighbor that changed the water pattern and now their yard's holding more water than they expected. And so they're like, I've never had an issue with drainage there but the water table has changed a little bit in that garden. So it's things to be conscious of. And the biggest thing we see with this too is people overreacting. Japanese maples, they're used to being outside. So they're used to cold weather they're coming in the fall when it should, when cold weather should come. And so if it's just cold weather coming in the fall when cold weather should come, if the Japanese maple's not over fertilized and the Japanese maple is a healthy plant, it's going to be used to that. And so keep that in mind that a healthy Japanese maple is going to do fine in situations that it's used to going through. It's part, that's part of nature. Um, Japanese maples are really adaptable and they live, they can live for hundreds of years. Yeah. We saw a 400 year old Japanese maple in Japan. We were on a Japanese TV show. We happened to notice, uh, you know, when one of the brochures were sitting there using Google translate, we're visiting Nakata san and we're translating and it says we're less than an hour's drive from the national treasure of Japan. Oh, wow. What's this national treasure tree? That sounds kind of cool. It's a Japanese maple. Okay, so we have to go see this. And we got to go see an over 400-year-old Japanese maple. And this tree, you know, it's maintained itself. It's 400 years old. It's a gorgeous specimen. It is uh, something that's lived so many generations. And so these are plants that are going to outlive us. A healthy, grafted Japanese maple should live to be well over 100 years old. So I often tell people, you know, this is a plant you're going to plant, but it's going to be around for future generations to come. It's trees that my grandmother planted in the 1950s, and we're still enjoying these trees today. Japanese maples, they're such an easy plant to grow. They're pretty maintenance-free. We've tried to cover a lot of the basics on Japanese maples and a lot of the things that we've seen go wrong and try to help you out so that you don't make those same mistakes. I mean, we've seen this on so many levels with Japanese maples. We've seen them grown all across the country and all around the world and the same mistakes happen pretty much everywhere. And if we can avoid these mistakes and fertilize correctly, water correctly, and have it plant the Japanese maple correctly, 
and start out by choosing the right Japanese maple for the right spot, your Japanese maple is going to be beautiful and it's going to be something that you can enjoy and have fun with in your garden. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. It's a really simple one for a lot of folks, but it's kind of one of those things where if you follow these steps, you're going to have good success. Japanese maples are easy to grow. If you start out with a healthy, happy Japanese maple, it's very easy to keep it that way. You don't have to have a green thumb. It's one of those plants people say, oh, you'll have to have a green thumb to grow. That sounds hard to grow because it looks so exotic to people. I think it can be intimidating. You know, people hear about all these different steps, and it sounds like you have to be this next level gardener, but it's one of the easiest plants I've ever seen to grow. I mean, Japanese maples are so, so simple. Anybody can grow one. Just follow these simple steps, and you're going to have great success. We wanted to get this one on our podcast early on. We've got a lot of different stuff coming. We couldn't go too far into our podcast without addressing this so that you guys got the step-by-step. But we're going to be doing some incredible interviews here. I've already got several interviews lined up here on the Mr. Maple Show with some experts. We're going to be talking to people about all kinds of different topics. Some of the top people in the world for Japanese maples are going to be on here. It's going to be a lot of fun and exciting stuff. So, again, uh, it's one small click for you, but it means a lot to us. Make sure to subscribe to our podcast. Make sure to find us on YouTube on the Mr. Maple Show and give that a sub. We're putting out daily content, and it's a lot of really cool stuff. And if you're watching us on YouTube, our podcast on YouTube, get involved in the live chat. We've got that feature available where you can get involved in the community and talk to other people who are watching this video in the very first premiere of our podcast. So get involved with that. You can get to know some of the people out there. That's a fun way to get involved in some Japanese maple community to make some friends with other people who grow Japanese maples. Also, find this, find our podcast if you're listening to this for the first time. Find our podcast on your favorite podcast forums. Make We're, sure to rate it five stars too. Yeah, that helps us a bunch. We're on Spotify. We're on Amazon Music. We're on uh, Pandora. We're on iHeartRadio podcast. So if you go down all these different podcasts, you can find us and listen to our weekly podcast. And we're working hard. We spend a lot of money on a lot of gear for our podcast and employees editing everything. We want to make it as premium as possible. We only want to go up from here, guys. Hey, special thanks to Sean Richardson. He's the guy playing those great guitar riffs you're hearing at the beginning and the end of our show. And he's mixing these things down. Brian's often involved in that whole process, too. Uh, guys, we're just so excited about this. We want to be bringing you the best possible Japanese maple content. We want this to be your Japanese maple talk show. So always let us know what topics you'd like to see next. Uh, some of your favorite guests you'd see coming on here. And we're just going to keep striving to improve that. We really appreciate y'all watching. Make sure that you sign up for our weekly emails on mrmaple.com if you like Japanese maples, because we put at least 10 new trees out every Tuesday at 10 a.m. And there's people from all around the United States who jump on at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time trying to get the newest and coolest Japanese maple or some of those old classics that no one else is producing. Take care. God bless. And have a great day.